why they did that. So let's say that you have an asthmatic who's got a cough, uh, thinking that my first thought would be cough, asthma, that maybe your asthma is uh, out of control. Maybe you should have a recent viral episode, twitchy airways, and we talked about viruses inducing bronchial hyper responsiveness, one of the typical features of asthma, and how this hyper responsiveness of the airway comes and eventually goes, usually in a month. But many patients, I know you've seen in the clinic before, who will come into you and say, I have a cough, and then you get a history. Oh, yeah, it started with a cold, but boy, I've been coughing and coughing and coughing since. Now, this may be the prelude to asthma, but it may just be the so called post infectious cough. There's a category called post infectious cough, which lasts a couple of months. And these patients act as if they have uh, sort of a milder form of cough air and asthma. And it actually does go away if you, you treat them with anti inflammatory therapy, uh, proper dilators, and so forth. Uh, so that would be my first thought. Um, she tells us that she had a history of asthma beginning seven years ago. Uh, on further questioning, she's had intermittent night sweats over the past two months. Certainly nothing you'd expect from asthma. Um, shortness of breath with exertion. So her asthma seems to be out of control, but she's got these night sweats. She said that the same thing happened to her about nine months ago, but it uh, went away. At that time, she was given oral antibiotics and her symptoms resolved. Now, currently you have her on a inhaled corticosteroid <coughs> and a PRN short-acting beta agonist. So <coughs> with this history and the night sweats, um, you know, obviously everybody thinks night sweats, you think about you know, TB, but rarely you see TB as a cause of uh, night sweats. And <coughs> I'm not sure exactly why people get night sweats. And certainly we know that excessive sympathetic discharge uh, can cause uh, like cause sweating, we, we've all had that. Ready to take an exam, I get a little sweaty. So um, maybe that's what she was experiencing at night. Uh, maybe her fever was going up. We don't exactly know at this point. Okay, so you uh, examine her, find out that she's got a fever, slight 100.6 Fahrenheit, pulse rate uh, 122 a bit. It was a little high. Uh, blood pressure is, no, is okay. There were a few scattered. Uh, oh my God, I, I didn't do this very well, did I? Uh, uh, crackles in both uh, lung fields. Rout. That's supposed to be rout. You know what this is? I have a voice. I have a, a, a dragon system. Uh, <laughs> so instead of rout, it said rows. But that's what would happen. I just, I'm sorry. I, I'll uh, tell you what this problem. Okay. So uh, so she's got crackles now. You know that there are crackles that can be heard with airway disease, particularly COPD. The crackles that are heard with airway disease are usually early inspiratory crackles. And you really can tell the difference. So now that I told you this, you want you, want you to go upstairs and listen to some patients, and I'll bet you you can tell the difference. Rows of congestive heart failure, a pathic pulmonary fibrosis, pneumonia, are late inspiratory crackles. As opposed to COPD or airway disease, where there's early inspiratory crackles. Uh, it's a pretty well known distinguishing point. So she had early inspiratory crackles and wheezes, which would be consistent with her asthma. She's got a CBC of 12,300, 68% polys, uh, whoops, six, it must be 6% lymphocytes, and 50% eosinophil. So I got something wrong there, but the eosinophil is right. <coughs> so she's got a lot of eosinophils. She's got asthma. Uh, hemoglobin was 15. The patient was given a five day course of azithromycin with no improvement. Okay. Here is her chest x ray. Now, anybody want to comment now about this? So it's an AP film. Yeah. Female patient. Looks like a good inspiratory visit element of a hyperinflation demonstrated by the number of. I'll, I'll take that back. It's not a hyperinflation. Yeah, Just uh, she's nice thin and you have too many ribs in the view. It's a good inspiratory film. The yeah. opacity. How are lower lobes looking? So the, the right side. Uh, 
does look denser than the rest of the lung, and so is the left side a little bit, but yeah. not as, as high as the right side. How about upper versus lower? There's another uh, classification of uh, uh, more of a dense uh, upper sure. lung. Sure, but so she, uh, it's, it's vague, but the more you look, obviously she's got something yeah. here a little yes. more dense, but she sort of has kind of this haziness, and yet the lower lobes, except maybe here, this may be a here, seem to be relatively spare. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at this point, this patient's been symptomatic for weeks. It doesn't, she's got upper lobe disease, she's been on a hail of steroids, there's at least one study I know that shows Actually, there is a slightly increased incidence of uh, tuberculosis in patients. They, uh, it wasn't done in this country, though. Uh, using inhaled corticosteroids. And you're saying, I don't know, this certainly isn't a garden variety regular pneumonia. So you say, you know, I think for better definition, maybe we'll look for the media sign and looking for lymphadenopathy. Let's do a CT. And the CT made the diagnosis. Now that you see the CT, you can understand why the chest x-ray looked like that. Mm -hmm. Ready for your question, your board question? Mm -hmm. uh, hang on, before the question. So you call the pulmonary team and you say, hey look, we need a bronchoscopy. This could be something really serious, infectious, whatever. We don't know. Bilateral upper lobe infiltrates. Total white count for BAL was 188. There were 17 polys, four limbs, 32% eosinophils, and the rest alveolar macrophages. How many alveolar macrophages should there be, percentage-wise, if I did BAL on? Almost all, 95%. I mean, we have very, very few other white cells, maybe one to one percent, two percent. Neutrophils. I mean, they're all alveolar macrophages. If you look at a normal lung, that's what we have down there. These macrophages are the good guys. You know, they gobble up dust and, you know, cover particles and so forth. Um, that uh, viruses, remember viruses are very, very tiny, less than one micron, maybe about a half a micron. So they get down to the alveolar level, and that's where you can get alveolar. Uh, okay, so Graham's thing is negative. Wet preparations uh, are negative for uh, 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 fungus. Okay. Now your question. So you say to the patient, oh, uh -huh, I know what you got. And she wants to know, sort of, okay, I'm going to treat you, but is this, am I going to get better? Am I going to get worse? So let's see which of these following statements is false. The condition that she has frequently relapses. It's recommended that corticosteroids should be given for at least three months. Chest radiograph findings typically resolve quickly within 10 days. Progression of disease results in permanent restrictive defect with the heat increased to freezing capacity. If left untreated, this disease can be fatal. All right. Everybody know what her diagnosis is? Hmm? You do? I don't. You don't? Yeah. Well, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so what do we know about her? She ha She's an asthmatic. Important setup. She has kind of intermittent symptoms. She was sick before, and then she got better, and then now she's really getting much sicker again with fever, night sweats, and so forth. She has a very abnormal x-ray with a very typical, bizarre pattern. I mean, it... it out here, a little here, a little here, but there is almost like a like a bat wing, reverse. Not like bat wing pulmonary edema, but this is clear and this is not clear. And what did she have on her VAL? Large number of eosinophils. What did she have her for the blood? Large number of eosinophils. What you just seen? What you just seen? Okay, if you've never seen it before, you'll never, never, never miss this again. It's a diagnosis of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Now, you learned in medical school, I'm sure, about acute eosinophilic pneumonia. 
and you learned all the causes of the parasitic disease and it can do this, Leffler syndrome, which is immediate pathic drug reactions and so forth, where you can have patchy infiltrates, using a building model, hypersensitivity kind of reaction. The disease I'm showing you now is called chronic using a building model. And the, the hallmark of this, the absolute every case has got this, is this weird x-ray pattern and CT pattern. If you ever see this reverse vacuum appearance, Sometimes you may not see it on a peripheral uh, 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 smear uh, with the cells, but you will see it in the, in the BAL, not the lodge. Are these the patients who get confused with cough variant asthma symptom-wise? No, because remember, cough variant asthma has nothing on the X-ray. Uh -huh. X-ray is normal. Yeah. These are confused with a larger problem of acidosis, but uh, if the X-ray pattern is so typical, then perhaps we'll talk about that later. Uh, that uh, that's what this patient has. So unbelievably typical, and that's what you see. These findings of infiltrates that are almost always right along the edge of the border, like like that reverse. But you know, this is all clear, centrally clear, and the outside has this casement, and no one understands why, but that's what it looks like. It's so typical. So here's what we know about this. This is a disease that is easy, easy to treat. It is true that the chest radiograph will resolve within days. This is another feature of uh, allergic type of uh, lung infiltrates, like acute eosinophilic pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. And especially if you have a patient who kind of has these recurrent episodes of something, you've got infiltrates, and the next time it comes in, they're always giving you an antibiotic. And you're saying, you know, this patient doesn't have any deficiency or antibiotic or blood is okay. What in the world is this recurrent pneumonia? Think about non infectious pneumonia, like allergic pneumonia. And one of the hallmarks of allergic pneumonias, like the eosinophilic pneumonias, acute or chronic, is that you give them a whiff of corticosteroids and it goes woof like that. Sometimes within a day or two. The infiltrate's clear. Now, have you ever seen pneumococcal pneumonia clear in a day or two? No. And that would be an important differential point. If you ever saw a patient, you give him corticosteroids, do an x ray 48 hours, 72 hours, you know, in that very short range. If that x ray clears, it's obviously not a pyogenic pneumonia. It's not H. flu. It's not pneumococcus. It's not pseudomonas or whatever pneumonia. It just, it just doesn't go away that, that quickly. Eosinophilic pneumonia, this kind of an inflammation does. Now, the problem, so C would be totally correct. It is true that, that this disease, remember, eosinophils have a lot of bad things in them, uh, enzymes, uh, myeloperoxidase, and so forth, and they can cause a lot of tissue damage. You see this mostly in, in, in eosinophil vasculitis. But if indeed this is not treated uh, appropriately, you can go on to fibrotic changes, restrictive lung disease, lung diffusing capacity. Uh, it's not like idiopathic fibrosis. Many fibrosis is not that diffuse, uh, but it uh, it can do that. Uh, if left untreated, the disease can be fatal. It can actually be a really severe acute eosinophilic pneumonia. The patient comes in, may even look like they have sort of an ARDS picture, way out of the chest X-ray, sicker than hell. You do a quick BAL. You see massive numbers of eosinophils. You treat them with corticosteroids. Bam, better than they are. It's miraculous. Can we diagnose this without doing a BAL just by the response to corticosteroids? You, you know, the answer is probably yes. Uh, uh, as I said, most of these patients do have a peripheral eosinophilia. So if you see, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of the eosinophils in a peripheral smear uh, and, and an x ray infiltrate, the answer is yeah, I would in that setting uh, say, you know, bacterial pneumonia doesn't cause, you know, 25 percent eosinophils in a peripheral blood. Now, could it be that this patient has uh, uh, infection and hyperacinophilic syndrome, or let's say asthma or something? Yeah, so you, you may, depending upon your clinical judgment, uh, put the patient on antibody too. Uh, but here too, uh, you look at that x-ray within, within 48 hours, it's going to melt. And you don't see that. But yeah, I think in certain circumstances, sure, you can do that. Uh, 
Now, the, the problem with this disease, and again, we don't understand much about this disease, is that it frequently relapses. And that's why uh, answer number B is incorrect, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. And what happens is, if you put the patient on steroids, he feels great, she feels really terrific, wonderful, thanks, you're a great doctor, goodbye. They run out of the prednisone, all comes back. And these patients often have to be treated for a long, long period of time, months and months, even a year or, or more. So this is the syndrome, now you've seen it. This is one of those that Aunt Minnie's that you'll never forget. You know what an Aunt Minnie is? So let's say that you're walking down the street, and you do have an Aunt Minnie, let's say. Okay? And you're walking down the street, and you see two women coming to you. And you say, oh, you see the one on the left? That's my Aunt Minnie. How do you know? She looks like Aunt Minnie. I always recognize her. Okay? This is your Aunt Minnie. You're going to see this pattern. You're going to go, oh, that's chronic use of pneumonia. How do you know that? Oh, that's my Aunt Minnie. <laughs> you'll know who she is. So, at any rate, um, that's that disease. Now, I, I, I put this slide on uh, from a, a medical article because I just it's sort of good to sort of back up a little bit. So, talk about some of the features of this and other kinds of, uh, of pneumonias. All right, let's look at CEP, which stands for chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Okay, it's insidious. This is not acute bacterial pneumonia like pneumococcus, where you get sick one day and you're in the emergency room half dead that night. It just doesn't work that way. So it's just sort of a slow, insidious kind of illness, and she was sick and even, even be relapsing before she got better with God knows what, and then all of a sudden it gets better, then worse again. So that's chronic use of mild shortness of breath, low grade fevers, occasional cough, obviously pre existing asthma. Now, most patients do. Can you get this without asthma? Yeah, but it's much, much less, less likely. Uh, signs of consolidation, which she had. Peripheral blood, usually eosinophils, greater than 10%. Chest, uh, you may see, see bilateral, maybe migratory, but those photo, photogenic negative of pulmonary edema picture, you've got the diagnosis. Uh, BAL, we talked about eosinophils there, greater than 25%. Uh, lung biopsy, we should show uh, alveoli just packed with eosinophils. Uh, no response to antibiotic, dramatic response to steroids. Now, you may have thought about another diagnosis, COP. Remember we used to call this diagnosis <coughs> bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia boop. We don't boop anymore, we just hop. Okay? And uh, it's a long story of what why and actually this year I'll <coughs> show you cop and show you some pictures and discuss diagnoses, etc. But just by comparison, it too is insidious, slowly progressive, signs of consolidation. Uh, the peripheral blood usually is not with the acidophilia. Uh, you may have unilateral bile or Apache infiltrates. Again, the BAL is very nonspecific. You don't really see much. Uh, the, the way you make this, this uh, diagnosis is in a transbronchial or open biopsy. In the airways, that bronchiolitis obliterans part of it, you actually see these little fronds, these little fingers like extensions uh, into the airway, uh, so called the saw bodies, which are uh, granulation tissue in the smaller airways. And then, of course, out in the periphery, you see the organizing pneumonia. And no response to antibiotic, dramatic response to steroids. Bacterial pneumonia, I don't have to tell you, it's obviously signs of consolidation. A lot of polys in the peripheral. <coughs> um, consolidation is usually lateral, uh, unilateral. This is one of the mistakes that, that I, I, I've often seen. And, and a patient comes in and has infiltrates that are bilateral, and the patient uh, is diagnosis is acute bacterial pneumonia. There, there are some instances, I'm sure you've all seen patients who came in with acute bilateral A, you rush them off to the ICU. These are four plus six patients. Most of the time you see the garden variety pneumonias being unilateral. They're here. You know how they're here. Anaerobic pneumonia, H. flu pneumonia, and copper pneumonia. Staff pneumonia, they're usually not. Now they may extend to other lobes, but bilateral disease is just pretty unusual. Now there are diseases that are frequently bilateral. Viral pneumonia, frequently viral, uh, bilateral, even legionella pneumonia. It's, it's usually not. And if the patients die bilateral bacterial pneumonia, they are just poor. But they're not walking through the world. They're extremely sick. 
But when you see viral pneumonia, you sort of step back and say, hmm, that's not very typical for bacterial pneumonia. What else could it be? Or could this be not an infectious type of pneumonia, like cough? Um, uh, and then the, um, uh, the last is uh, acute uh, eosinophilic pneumonia and um, fever, cough, chest pain. These are, so I told you, patients that are extremely sick. They look like they came in with ARDS. And BAL show. There, there you've got to do a BAL. Because uh, usually, often, the, the purple smear is not, uh, as you see here, purple blood, no eosinophils. Uh, but the eosinophils are abundant in now. The other, uh, if you did biopsy, you see a lot of eosinophils. Dramatic response to steroids. So, acute eosinophil pneumonia looks like ARDS, just bilateral whiteout. Chronic eosinophil pneumonia is that, you know, photogenic, photographic, whatever, negative pandemic. Okay, here are the relapse rates, as you see, very, very high. Uh, relapse rates here with the dysentery studies. Okay, uh, let's talk about this 29 year old male. Uh, can't remember his story, but uh, uh, fever is right side of fluid, chest pain, shortness of breath, wheeze, chest tightness, occasional cough, and productive recurrent and sputum, denies hemoptysis, rash, joint or eye problems. He does have also a history of asthma, and there's the connection. He's got asthma. Temperature is okay, right side of crepitation is on auscultation. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember this guy. So here's the submission chest expert. All right, 29 year old asthmatic. Now, do, do asthmatics have increased incidence of bacterial pneumonia or viral pneumonia? No, they're not sure they just suppressed in that, that way. Mm -hmm. Like everybody else, they don't have any more than, than the average. All right, now you see his x ray. He's treated with uh, uh, cephalosporin and, and cipro. Uh, why he was treated with cipro, I don't know. I, <laughs> a discharge on uh, inhaled corticosteroid and lava and albuterol inhalers. Six weeks later, a follow up chest x ray shows chronic upper lobe changes, and the high resolution CT is shown on the next slide. Okay, so you saw his infiltrate. That went away, and now this is what we got. This is just a, a um, representative uh, picture of what he's got. Okay. So let me get up close and uh, show you some things here. From me, okay? Oh, well, it's okay. So obviously, uh, your eye is. Um, drawn to this area here. So let's not do that first. Okay? Let me show you a shadow which is very unusual. You see that dot there? Obviously it's a blood vessel. What's next to this dot here? What do you think that is? What, what always runs next to blood vessels? Uh, bronchi. Bronchi, exactly. Does that look like a bronchi to you? More like a bronchus. Right, but it's a bronchus because it's running right next to the vessel. So what's wrong with it? It's too big. It's too big. Exactly. It's too big. Anytime you see a bronchus next to the blood vessel that's, that's bigger than the blood vessel, that's abnormal. That's exactly right. Bronchiectasis. Now, one of the features of this bronchiectasis is, and I'm going to we'll talk about this later, is this bronchiectasis, evidence of bronchiectasis here, is not here. Okay? So, what I'm describing to you is more of a central bronchiectasis, aren't it? As opposed to a peripheral bronchiectasis. Okay. So, then we have something here which. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what this is, but then we've got this funny little structure out there. It almost looks like a Y. See it? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's look on the other, now the abnormal side. We've got this lump of something here. It shouldn't be there. Okay, and then we have all this stuff out here. What do you think? Well, these are big holes. Certainly bigger than blood vessels in this area that we can look at. And this and this are probably the same thing. 
and looking at areas of bronchiectasis in a more central distribution than a peripheral distribution. And this, who knows?